Amen. Thanks, Brandon. That is fantastic. And Merry Christmas. Great to see y'all. I love this time of year. Love everything about it. Love the lights, singing, all the stuff. We got snow tonight. Did you know that? It's coming. Uh, Come in here. Uh, And we'll remind you that as we close our time together. Christmas is such such a nostalgic time too, isn't it? You look back. You don't have to be really old to be nostalgic about Christmas. Like you can be 10 years old and like, man, when I was five, I mean, that, that was killer. Like that was when I got... Like, I don't know if it'd be fun to hear from you what your favorite Christmas memory is. If you have, you know, there's probably tons. Um, your favorite gift at Christmas time. Mine was uh, Batman outfit. I mean, I, I was Batman for like a year after that. Um, the belt, the whole thing. But uh, yeah, so it's so nostalgic that oftentimes, um, you know, we just look back on all things that were and how great things used to be, right? Um, and yeah, Christmas time also, it comes around every year, of course. So there's all of these um, traditions. So I think that plays into it as well. Uh, this past week, Stacy and I were at our Connect Group uh, Christmas party. And one of the things we did, there was a, we had a game where a person got up and did uh, charades with Christmas songs. And then if you got it right, then you got up and led everybody in the song. So I was like, I don't know if I want to win this or not. I'm not sure how that goes. But, um, but we all knew the song, is my point. We knew every song, like every lyric, every word to every song that we were singing, whether they were carols or just fun Christmas songs, because that's the way Christmas goes. It's like, man, it, it's, it, it becomes part of our lives, right? Our memories, even the songs become a part of our lives. And, and today I want to talk about Uh, Not only that Christmas allows us to look back at the first advent, but you've already picked up on this a bit in our singing, our worship, but it focuses on the second advent. We live here in the in-between, but what happens oftentimes, I think, is that because, and Christmas can be a really challenging time as well, um, because our our pain, our struggles of life become more acute at Christmas time, up against the backdrop of, well, we're supposed to be happy and everybody joyful and joy of the world. And so I think if you're one of those, and I think all of us in varying degrees, the challenge that we face might become a bit more acute and it can be a really hard season. But here's what happens. We often get so nostalgic, perhaps, about Christmas time and the way it was that it's possible to look back and we start to think that our best days are behind us and not in front of us. And I just want you to, to kind of get your mind around that. Again, maybe, I don't know if it's an age thing, perhaps. The older we get, sometimes, like, yeah, that was, man. Or the days ahead are getting fewer and fewer, you know, as we get really, you know, older and older. But do you ever feel like the best, your best days are behind you and not ahead? I want to talk about that today because the thing that I want you to hear today over and over again and let it ring into your uh, ears, into your head and your heart is that in Christ, the best is yet to come. And that's what Christmas teaches us. So go ahead and turn to uh, Isaiah 11. And uh, I'm gonna uh, answer the question kind of, how do we live in the in-between? How can we look forward to the days ahead in Christ? And I'm not just talking like, yeah, someday I'm gonna die and everything's gonna be fine. I'm talking about this week and the week to come. How does the hope forward allow us to live differently? And we're gonna look at, at three things. We can look forward to a lot today. And that's what I want you to get excited about as you live your life. Uh, Believers, Christians should be the most optimistic, hopeful people on the planet. And too often we're not seen that way. And we, and yet we are, we look forward to his rule. We look forward to his reign and we look forward to his realm. That's how this is going to break down. First, we look forward to his rule. Now I've got to place this seemingly random uh, prophecy because you're just, you're just stepping into this. I've been in this text for a long time. Uh, put it in context a little bit. If you've been with us, you know that uh, we've been looking at Isaiah and the prophecies that point to the coming Messiah, but also there are, there are passages that then catapult us into uh, the new kingdom, into the new earth, the new heaven and the new earth. See, the Christian life is not about get me out of here. The Christian life, listen to this. This is a paradigm shift for some of us. It's not going somewhere. The Christian life is actually something that has arrived here, the kingdom of God. Jesus said, the kingdom is now among you. He ushers in the kingdom. He's preaching the kingdom. This is a major shift for some of us. Because you see, the whole point of, of scripture, the whole point of Jesus coming is he's king and he's coming to rule over his kingdom. 
on earth as it is in heaven. And we probably ought to do an entire series on this someday. There's coming a new earth and a new heaven. We're not off somewhere else. It's heaven come to us. Look at Revelation 21. It's heaven coming here. And that kind of blows your mind. The best shadows, the best uh, glimpses of the future, your greatest days, are they're just images and pictures of what it's going to be like. A resurrected people on a resurrected earth worshiping a resurrected Savior. Again, that's an entirely different uh, topic here, but it's where all this is heading. These prophecies are a lot about Assyria, the place in historical context. Because here's, here's the point. Um, biblical prophecy has a uh, progression about it. Oftentimes, it, it can be, it's called an escalation of prophecy. In other words, it can mean something. This is wild, a, a dynamic. Means something to the people, the first hearers, and then it's ultimately fulfilled more so and completed in the future. That's what we see here. So you think, what were they reading here? Well, because we see it clearly in Christ, and these prophecies are bleak. Because the series coming down on Israel and Judah, it's not just, hey, things are going to get tough for a little while. It's like, no, your life, your life as you know it is going to be completely changed. And this is heartbreaking for the people. I mean, they could have legit said, our best days are behind us. I mean, and the last thing on their mind was kind of nostalgia because all they're doing is, I mean, it's a divided nation. I mean, you know, not unlike what we feel today, polarized. I mean, they're like, man, we're so polarized. I feel like we're a divided kingdom. Oh, wait, we are. I mean, they were already divided. Now they got Judah and Israel. Now Assyria is coming down on them. That's what Isaiah is talking about. Throughout this, he said, turn and repent, turn. And all they're doing is watching the news. And the news is telling them Assyria is coming. You guys are going down, and it, I mean, nostalgia is not on their mind at this point, but they could look back and say, yikes, the future is bleak. Maybe our best days are behind us. And what's happening is the message is coming then through Isaiah, in this passage, is to a remnant, is to a people, here's how this works, who are going to be standing after the judgment comes. Think Noah, right? And it's often called the righteous remnant because they're the ones who are still standing after the judgment has come, Noah and his family in that case. And in this cultural moment, it makes me wonder to ask the question, will we be the remnant in this moment, in our lifetime, that remains faithful to him, regardless of what comes our way? And so what is the hope that the remnant has? And what is the hope that we have? Look at verse one. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Now, okay, a twig is our hope. Thanks. All right. Um, a branch, a stick coming out. Immediately we're thinking, what, what is this? But again, watch this. The dynamic nature of prophecy, this escalation, what we see here is in theological terms, we call it a type. It's a shadow. It's a form of what is to come. And what we're going to see here, the Messiah is going to rule and he's going to bring his people home. All right. So in verse one, we see the Messiah is both a shoot and a root of Jesse. He's saying, and there's a lot of prophecy around this that we don't have time to go to. He's saying there's a completely new David that's coming. Notice it's not the shoot of David. It's shoot of Jesse. And so it's, a, it's the line of Jesse. This is the last one. This is the eternal one. And the Old Testament does not resolve this at all. Nowhere is the shoot and root as the Messiah resolved in the Old Testament. Only in Christ do we see this resolved. And now we know it on the other side. Again, this is a shadow. There's a progression. Look at this, a shoot. There's a twig. There's a branch. There's a fruit. You see, it bears fruit. And, we, and then in the New Testament, the kingdom of God is described that way. In fact, the work that Jesus is doing in your life and mine by his spirit is described that way. What starts off seemingly insignificant, like a mustard seed, it it grows and it grows. And God's doing that in us as we walk with him and follow him. He continues, I'm I'm growing, I'm a branch now, I'm, I'm bearing fruit. And that's the end game. He wants us to bear fruit, the fruit of his spirit, fruit of the spirit in us, living the life that he's called us to. And so this message of progression is for them and it's for us today. And it's this. Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. And all of this is a result of the mark or the characteristics of the rule of the king. 
So hang with me here. A rule is like a guide. It's a code of conduct. You might think of a rule of life, right? Uh, The way that a king has power and how he uses it. How a queen has power, how they they use it. You see, a, a rule of a king can be tyrannical. A rule of a king can be benevolent. Uh, We describe uh, the rule of kings in that way, stable or unstable, prosperity or not. And look at verse 2. Here's the characteristic of the rule of this king. The spirit of the Lord will be upon him. This is the word ruach. We talked about the presence of God last week, his, his presence that's come in the spirit. The spirit of God will rest on him, will be on this king. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Spirit, four times ruach. The spirit of counsel and might. Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Spirit, this reverence of the Lord. He will be guided, watch this, permanently by the spirit of God all the time. Not just, well, David, some of the time. Solomon, you know, your pastor, anybody, like some of the time, you know, he gets it right. Permanently, this ruler, this king, will do exactly what is right. His rule is marked by wisdom and understanding. He knows the right thing to do, and every decision he makes is right. It says counsel and might. He knows what's best, and he has the power to do it. Knowledge and reverence of the Lord, fear of the Lord. His mind is totally aligned with God. This is Jesus who is one with the Father and the Spirit. Then he uses some metaphorical language to come. Look at verse 3. And this delight, okay, his delight, his great pleasure shall be the fear of the Lord. Like my pleasure is just to honor him, revere him. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. That's all we've got, right, essentially. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Now, that's a lot. What is he saying here? He's going he's gonna, to uh, be fair to the wealthy and to the poor. He, he doesn't judge according to appearance, according to possessions. And look at this. His mouth, his voice has the power to change things. He speaks and hearts are changed. God speaks and he creates, right, in Genesis. I'm thinking of the words of Jesus. Jesus' words, you're like me, have changed my life. He speaks and he changes life. The the, the plant here is Jesus Christ. He's the ruling king to come. And he has come. So when we think of of, of rule, we think of a king, we think of leadership, of course, right? And, and, uh, you know, leadership has a lot to do with looking forward, whether we're looking forward to the future or not. I've heard leadership described as a transference of enthusiasm. And most often that has to do with a preferred future. Has to do with a vision forward, right? If we trust in the leader, uh, and th- th- you know he's going to rule correctly, then we can trust the future. We can move forward together. This is so important, parents. Listen to this, young parents, older parents. Uh, th- this is so important. The best thing that you can do for your children is to love your spouse. As your kids are growing up, like Stacy and I, with our children, as they were growing up in our home, we always look. Mom and dad totally love each other. We're going to stick together. We're not going anywhere. We are in this thing for the long haul. And what happens is you create then this comfort, uh, an environment of security and safety in the hearts of your children. And then they can not only enjoy the present, they can look forward to the future. We've got hope. But when there's distrust, we don't know what the future holds. And there's this constant angst and anxiety. And, And so a lot of us, Here's where we are as older, maybe older adults. Uh, we, we find ourselves distrusting people. You know, I, I know people like that that, that have a hard time trusting others. They're almost always distrusting. And you always wonder, you know, like, have I, what, what have I done so that you don't distrust me, perhaps? You, you ever have someone that maybe you work with, maybe somebody, maybe it's you, somebody, where you honestly just, I can't trust people because your past it gives you a reason not to trust. See, some of us, we, we struggle. How about this? Some of us look back and we can, we're on nostalgia about the past. Uh, our best days are behind us because our, our days were so awesome. 
I mean, my, my, I, my growing up years were really pretty legit, really legitimately good. I had loving parents. I look back on my Christmases. I don't have memories that some of us have. We look back maybe and go, no, some of the most heartbreaking moments were at Christmas time or when the family is back together. Some of y'all are nervous about family coming together this week, maybe, because of unresolved relationships. And, and, and to know that, that we're moving in a direction and now the kingdom has come in us, we can live in such a way that we can put the past behind us. We don't have to project the past onto others in the future, people who might have hurt us in the past. We can forgive, we can move forward. See, when we've been hurt by the past, we're reluctant to trust people in the future. See, some of us, we really think our best days are behind us. And I'm telling you, friends, in Christ, the best is yet to come. It's always yet to come. And so some of us, I can't trust again. And this is, I mean, it's kind of nuanced or it's really uh, subconscious maybe. I can't, I can't love again because I've been hurt. And we're, we're, it's because of distrust in our past. Some of us have little hope for the future because we cast the past onto the future. I can't take away the pain of my past. I can't take away the sins of my past. Uh, I can't take away the pain of the things I've done in the past to myself or to other people. But I know someone who can. And he continues to do that in me and he can do it in you. You can turn to him and say, Lord, I give you my past. Because see, hope has a name and his name is Jesus. You can trust him and he can help you trust others and be trustworthy as well. The baby in the manger is going to bring this righteous rule and it's going to be over all people forever. And it's why Mary sings in Luke one about the oppressors being brought down and those who are being pressed to be raised up. And it's, I mean, it's a coming kingdom and it's all because of the one who's going to be the king over the house of David. You can read it in Luke one this week. That's why we celebrate Jesus coming again. He's going to make all things right. This is the hope that we wait for in his return. So what started with this little baby is, is going to come to pass. So how can we free ourselves up from the past? If you have voices on repeat in your mind, you, you can bring it to the Lord. Bring your hurts to the king. Do what people have done for, for millennia. Bring your trouble to the king. Bring it to him so that he can fix it. Jesus took on your pain. He took on uh, the cross. He took on your shame, the crucifixion, so you wouldn't have to keep living that way. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he wants you to leave the past behind. The cross is the sign that the past is gone. You need to live that way today. And the resurrection is the sign that the best days are not behind you, but in front of you. Because in him, the best is yet to come. In him, the best is always yet to come. Let's say it together. The best is yet to come. I want to get that in your mind and your heart today because it can be so hopeful and, and, and it impacts the way we live now. I, I met with a, a family this week on Friday where we have a service tomorrow, funeral service again for someone who's passed, right? And, and, and the beautiful thing in all that is with all the challenge of, of health issues and struggle in recent days, and then to, you know, then to die. But in Christ, no, even death loses. The best is always yet to come. And then with death comes new life, new birth into ultimately this new kingdom. So we look forward to his rule, and we look forward to his reign. Check this out. The reign of a monarch is most awfully marked, is marked by, by a period of time. Right? In some cases, the monarch, uh, their, their reign lasts so long or it's so impactful that we even name uh, the era after them. You know, like in, in England, we've got the Elizabethan era. We've got the Victorian era. And a good king would be so remarkable that the entire culture has changed. And that's really what is meant here by his reign. He reigns and where he reigns, wherever he reigns, his will is accomplished when his people follow him. And so sometimes we see a, um, a monarch or a, an era of reign, a reign that is so remarkable that it's characterized by, by prosperity, by peace in the kingdom, by justice. And Jesus is going to take all these things 
to a next level. And in fact, I want you to see this, this metaphorical language in verse six. Listen to this. The, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Now, now catch this. this is, we're not, you know, I suppose, again, it could be literal, could be figurative, but I think it's metaphorical language to make a point. Watch this. The wolf, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. What? And the nursing child, wait, a little baby, shall play over the hole of a cobra. And the weaned child, I mean like a little one, shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in my ho- all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk says this too. The, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's where all of this is heading. So this is, fanta- this is a fantastic passage. And what I mean, it's a fantastical passage. What's happened here, we've just stepped uh, into the closet and we've gone into Narnia. Now we see what the new kingdom looks like. The new vision of where, where all this is heading. And here it is. There's no rivalries. This is what Isaiah is saying. Wolves and sheep, goats and leopards. There's no competition Because everybody has what they need under the reign of Jesus. There's no self-promotion. There's nobody standing in my way to get my thing done. And because that's so much of what relationships are about, isn't it? In our fallen, in our sinful state, get out of my way. I desire this. James says that in the New Testament. He says, it's because you don't get what you want. There's not going to be any of that. Because all that we need under the reign of the king is going to be provided for us. And I say this often. All the love that we need, we have found in him already, now. So I don't have to demand any love in return from others. I don't have to get out of my way. Because here's what's going to happen. Humanity will have dominion over the world again as God designed. That's what's described here. You know, Adam and Eve, we're going back to the garden here. Full circle, because Adam and Eve were placed in the garden and they were to be priests, royal priests, caring for God's creation, his sanctuary, and God was walking with them. In Revelation 21, it says, and God will be with them. He himself will be with his people. This is a picture back to the garden. And apparently, it's so easy to lead in the new kingdom, even a child can do it, right? Right? You know, it's, it's been said that leadership is easy except for people. And, and here, evidently, things are at such peace. Look at the passage. A lion and a leopard. He's literally herding cats. I mean, there's going to be a new phrase. It's as easy as herding cats. A child can do that. And then the most vulnerable, represented by children here, will not be harmed by the dangers of this world, represented by snakes See, this image fulfills uh, Genesis 3. The curse prediction says that there'll be animosity between uh, the, the, the offspring of the serpent and Eve's child to come. And here we see now all things. There's no more animosity. Jesus clears it all. There's no more division. And he calls us to that right now. To live as as kingdom representatives in the world. And then in verse 9, you see the culmination of it all. The glory of the Lord, the knowledge of the Lord will fill the whole earth like the waters cover the sea. Again, back to the garden, back to intimacy with him. See, friends, you can either live according to kind of the law of the jungle. Or you can live according to the law of love, the law of Eden. See, the law of the jungle says you kill or be killed, eat or be eaten. And a lot of us tend to live that way. Isn't that how people live in the world? And that is a a beat down. You can't live that way for long. Jesus calls us instead to lay down your sword. And this is probably a good week. But ongoing. This week, if you're going to gather with with family, or maybe it's people from, uh, you know, you had not seen in a while. Maybe maybe it's... So we've got a little animosity with. It's time to lay down the sword. It's time to just love for free. You can, you can live as an eternal predator. 
or you can live as an eternal victim. That's the law of the jungle. The law of love, the law of Jesus says that we don't lash out to people even when they upset us. We don't offer hurtful speech or retaliate. And this week, we can love others. And listen, you don't have to force people to follow your pace, to get with it. Instead, you can lovingly walk alongside them with patience and grace. This is the kind of reign and rule that the Lord guides us to and leads us in. And the great thing about it, gang, is that our best days are not behind us. Our best days are ahead of us. And here's the thing. When your ambition, watch this, is, is to know him and to pursue him, think about it. You just simply grow more and more to become like him, more in love with him, more aware of his love, then your best days are ahead of you because you keep on growing closer to him and someday we're gonna see him face to face. So his rule is such that we can trust him and we can look forward to the future. His reign is wherever he fills our hearts and the rule is no longer the, the law of the jungle, it's the law of Christ because we know, again, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Finally, we'll close with this. We can look forward to his, his realm. Now, a realm is, you know, king has a kingdom, right? A realm is, we often think, is, is that wherever, how about this? It's an area wherever the sovereignty of the king is found, wherever he rules, all right? And again, it's important to note, the kingdom has come and it comes into our hearts. As he reigns in us, we become, how about this? Your whole life becomes a realm. Wherever we go, we, 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 we advance the kingdom of Jesus. And, and so it's not, so, I wouldn't say it's as much a place as it is our hearts. And look at verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, that'd be Jesus, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This is a beautiful picture of outcast exiles being displaced, coming back home. This, and so verses 11 through uh, 13, he names all of these nations, right? The day of the Lord extend a hand a second time over the remnant that's gonna come. And he names them all from, from Assyria. Wow, Egypt, Pathros, Cush. He goes on and on, the coastlands of the sea. Verse 12, he will raise a, a, a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel. Jealousy will be cut off. The harassment of Judah will be cut off. There won't be any more jealousy. See, again, nobody's standing in our way. God scatters. I mean, his people are scattered, and he brings them all back. They've been all over the world, all over the known world, 10 tribes. Then in verse 14, not only that, he's going to swoop down on the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people. Watch, they're not just coming back empty. They're coming back full. They're cared for. They shall put out their hand against Edom and Moab, the Ammonites, and they all will shall obey him. All the, all the enemies. Everybody's going to be back together. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt, okay, which represents their first big barrier and all barriers to come. And he's going to wave his hand over the river. They're going to walk through all of it because he's dispersed, even the Red Sea. And there's a walk over with sandals on, verse 15. And then look at this. There'll be a highway from Assyria where the people have been taken from for remnant remains, just like he did, Israel had when they came out of Egypt. God will make a way when there is no way, is what he's saying here. And he's doing it in your life. Every obstacle will be removed. And so I've, I've just got to say this. If, if Jesus, if God is going to go to so, such great a length to break down all the barriers that, that we have in coming to him, shouldn't we do the same with other people? To do whatever it takes because Christ is coming. And so what is the big gap? What's the, what, what's, what's the, the crossing of the Red Sea for you? It's a sea of, of resentment. You need to forgive others. And I just want to, want to close with this challenge. The borders of the kingdom can be your entire life, your, your whole heart given over to him. And we can live with hope for what is to come because the king has made a way. He rules, he, he reigns, and his realm is forever and ever. Friends, listen, if you think your best days are behind you, you'll be right. If you believe that the best days are ahead in Christ, 
That in him, walking with him, they get better and better and better. Watch this. Just as great as the first advent was, ha, so much greater will be the second when he comes again. And all things that he began will culminate and will bring, bring, be brought to fruition always in him. The best is yet to come. Let's say it again. The best is yet to come. Believe it. Live in it. And as we go today, be a light in the world. Stacy and I have a thing at our house. I'll close with this. Um, you can't be in the room where the Christmas tree is without the lights being on. You can't do that. It's a rule. And here's the thing. If we live in the rule and reign, realm of his kingdom is our entire life. Everything we do, everything we say, we worship him with all we've got. You're going to be lit. <laughs> Not just Christmas time, but all the time. And that's the life he's called us to. So let's pray together as we close. Lord, we thank you for this word, an ancient word that shows us that you are at work, you're still at work, and you're completing what you started. And we thank you that you brought Jesus to us. Lord, that you came to us in the person of Christ. Thank you for the celebration that is ours this season, this week. Uh, Lord, I pray for those who are here that need to receive your grace. Maybe, friend, you're here right now. You've never done that. Today is your day. It's why the Lord brought you here. By faith, say, Lord, come into my heart. Thank you for coming to rescue me from my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for me so that I could receive your forgiveness, your grace. Lord, help us to live this week remembering your rule and your reign over us, your realm. That we live as kingdom representatives, as, as ambassadors in the world. Let our light shine for you because we know that the best is yet to come. In your name we pray, amen.